pornography with Susan. I'm your host, Purush, and I'm very, very happy to have you all here. Thank you very much for following us. Thank you very much for taking the time to come and listen to us live. And just thank you very much for giving us the support that you've given us. So today is E and it's E for Ekavira, and this is going to be slightly different from the very uh, cut and dried iconographic lives that you have had for this one. So Ekavira I, or Ekavira as she is known, is a very, very popular deity in Maharashtra, worshipped mainly by the Kolis, Agris, CKPs, and some of the other communities. Her number one shrine is outside the entrance to Chaitya Cave at Karla Cave Complex. She's essentially a folk goddess. Now, this is in no way making her any less or anything else. Uh, she just does not belong to the greater tradition of the streamlined goddesses of Hinduism as we understand it, but is part of a larger amorphous whole. She's a folk goddess and Nauta. She has to be propitiated. She has to be appeased. She is not a goody goody classic baby. She is not Annapurna. She is not the modern Lakshmi that we, that we have. She has to receive her due every time good fortune comes her way. If there is something important happening in your family, you have to share with her for her blessing. Nothing comes without the application of something. She has no specific life. Now, this is the interesting part of all this. This is an iconography which is formless. And the reason I've taken you for Ekavira is that there are hundreds of such folk policies across the length and breadth of Maharashtra and across the length and breadth of our country who are either worshipped as a single stone covered in vermilion or a rough sketch of a goddess in vermilion or sometimes a low relief or even a high relief, very, very generic culture of a female form which is worshipped as the mother goddess. Here, the iconography is not half as important as the faith of the believers that this is, icon is alive and represents the goddess that they relate to their worship. They believe it. So, very many different uh, what I it, shrines, temples exist to Ekavira across the country. And Sir, especially sorry to interrupt, the but there's some disturbance behind you. So, um, so there are, as I said, many different shrines of Ikavira at different places. The most common thing that you will see in the economically more, uh, well, the economically more prosperous temples is that the goddess will usually have what is called a bukhota or a face mask. She will invariably have a nose ring. Since I'm talking specifically about Ekavira, who's a Maharashtrian goddess, she will typically have the Maharashtrian nut or the pearl ring that you see in her nose over here. And this mukota is a mask which is applied to the image. And of course, there will be a sari, a short sari that will be clad over her. She may or may not have dagine or jewelry as it's called. And there will of course be flowers that are used in her worship. This mask may be of silver, it may be of copper, it may be of brass. Very, very rarely it may be of gold, but that's like completely an exception. But this is a very, very ancient tradition which goes back perhaps all the way to the Shilahara period because we have a beautiful mask, Ganesha, who we will talk about in one of our coming episodes. So she's the goddess of the people. As I said, she's not a goddess of the greater tradition of the organized Hinduism that we know of. And yet she plays a very, very important role in the day-to-day -day lives of the people who worship her. The Ekavira of Puranic traditions is very, very different. The Ekavira of the Kolis and the Ekavira that I've spoken to you till now essentially has her main shrine. And you see this black and white image on the top. And this is the shrine in the 19th century. This is the shrine more or less today as it exists now. It has become larger and larger. These are the Karla caves, first, second century Buddhist caves in the Western Ghats near Lonavla. And there's a beautiful image of Ikavira overlooking the hill and looking out towards the sea, um, drawn by Ravish Dhanavade, who does some very beautiful artwork of Ikavira. Do follow him on Instagram if you can. The Puranic Ikavira is essentially Mahakali. 
the Puranas say she is the divine mother. She is the original mother. And she was created to drink the blood of Andhaka. And according to the Matsya Puran, she is a very, very important deity who is a composite of many deities, up to 10 different entities who basically are representations of a single goddess itself. So she can bifurcate herself into 10 different bodies and she is yet one and she is Ekavira, okay? She is the one goddess. The Matsya Puran says most terrible were the, the Matrikas and they dr drank all the blood of the Andhakas and became satiated. So the Matrikas or Ekavira com compositely were created specifically to consume the blood of Andhakasura, the demon whose blood every time a single drop fell on the ground would result in another Andhaka rising up. So this is part of the legend of Andhakasura Vada and is very, very importantly there in the Matsya Puran. Her amalgamated form of these different deities brought together or what you would say is the Saptamatrikas or the Ashtamatrikas or in this case the Dashamatrikas brought together is Mahakali. So Mahakali is all these 10 forms that make up an individual entity. Yeah, I know it's a little difficult to come, you know, work your head around this. There are 10 mother goddesses, but she's actually one mother goddess. And the 10 mother goddesses then combine to form one mother goddess. And she is the cosmic aspect of the baby. And the physical, very physical personification itself of Tamas. She is blue, black, disheveled, fanged, has a lolling tongue, and very often is shown with 10 arms, 10 legs, and 10 heads. She is called the Dasa Mahavidya when she is shown like that. More recently, because we find it very difficult to have a 10 legged, 10 armed, 10 headed goddess. Okay, and I've always wondered why, uh, if she has 10 heads, she does not have 20 arms and 20 legs, but that is not part of the iconography. The iconography is very specific. And uh, we have one head, one pair of legs, and 10 arms. So this is the form that you see on the right hand side. This is a very modern drawing. And this is a very popular representation of Mahakali today. Uh, below her, of course, you see Mahakala, or Shiva in his Mahakala form. Uh, the Mundamala and the Narmunda, of course, are very, very common. Various different weapons are shown now. The Trishula, the Shankar, the Parashu, the Mace. Of course, there is almost without exception always a skull cup of fire in it. And this is the Agora Rupa of the goddess in many ways. As I said, she is the cosmic consciousness here is represented by Shiva. And she is the cosmic ability to take that consciousness and make it relevant. And she therefore embodies creation itself. So Ekavira in the Puranic tradition embodies the physical might of creation, where the physical consciousness of creation, which is Shiva, is basically seen under her as Mahagar. She is thus the embodiment of all the different gods and all the different goddesses, and is truly a composite individual deity and an individual entity in her own right. In Maharashtra, at a very unique place called Kolhapur, she is worshipped alongside Mahalakshmi and Mahasaraswati as the great holy trinity of the mother goddess, where these three forms together make up the complete embodiment of the deity itself. Her worship is, of course, very popular in the East and in Karnataka. And in Karnataka, surprisingly, the iconography is not different. So you have this very common modern representation on the left hand side. You have Mahakali from the east on the right hand side. This is a very typical uh, image that is made for Kali Puja and other times in Bengal, in Assam, in parts of Orissa, and even in parts of Jordan India, but mainly in Bengal. And this is what she looks like. These are the ten heads, the ten arms. And if you look below, there are four actually ten legs. On the left hand side, what you see is the most classical depiction of the Dasha Mahavidya with the 10 arms, 10 legs, and of course the Mundamala 
very, very clearly there. Very often the Mundamala, according to Puranic tradition, must have 108 heads and is virtually the Japamala of the goddess. And I've seen very beautiful examples made out of uh, animal bone, which are made up of 108 tiny skulls and which are used for chap by members of the Shakta family. On the right hand side, what you have is the Honsala era Mahakali. And here too, she is an amalgamation of Shaivite and Vaishnavite characteristics. There is the Trishula on the top left of Shiva over here. Uh, there is also the Damru over here. And there is, of course, the Skull Cup over here. And then you have well, various other attributes of the Devi here, including the club. Uh, she is again shown on Shiva over here. Shiva has the typical Bhairava headdress that you see over here. This is a rather odd representation, but the iconography of the Hoysalas would be an entire uh, multi hour long discussion because the Hoysalas don't necessarily follow the iconography that is in Hoysalas. Mahakali is an incredibly popular goddess and has become even more popular these days because of a major outing on the small screen. There is a very famous, uh, I think it's still running, um, serial called Mahakali. And uh, this has made the legend of Mahakali and the uh, worship of Mahakali even more prominent these days. So today is a short session. And thank you very much for being with us. These are our different handles on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and on LinkedIn. Thank you very much for being with us. Do press the bell icon and follow us. Do give us a thumbs up and do share the news of the series that we are doing. Our hashtag is ID Stories. And this is your host, Purush. We'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow is the alphabet F, and it's F for Fanishwa. Thank you very much. <laughs>